I'm realizing that now when you was playing the records back when you was uh, back in the days when you was playing the records and like everybody would come to the house and, and then you hear somebody say, let Dana play the records. I always like when he play the records because he plays everybody's favorite song in the house. And that was me by the stereo playing everybody's favorite song, Youngest of Five. In a house where in the early 70s where it was, it was really a lot of music going on. So we had disco. We also had WABC where everything was played on there from Kenny Loggins to South Soul Orchestra to El Loco to Rick Sarone, you know. So the music was like integrated and, and everybody was listening to WABC in my whole location of Queens. That's where a lot of the music and hip hop was born, you know. That's where I first heard super rapping. Rapper's Delight, I remember when that record came in the house, Record Explosion on Jamaica Avenue. Records for $3.99, $4.99, singles. I think my first production, it's weird because my first mental production, I would say would be uh, when there's a certain part of the record that you remember, that you keep looping in your head back in the days, you mentally start producing your favorite part of the song. I used to do that with Inseparable by Natalie Cole that had the beginning part. I used to do that as a little kid because, you know, in, in that music, there wasn't a lot of parts that were actually looped. They had dynamics. They had the intro, they had the, the verse, the hook. Everything was probably a different progression or a different dynamic. So I would find parts of the song that I loved a lot and loop. So I, I was producing probably in my mind like a seven years old, seven, eight years old. But I think my first production piece that I could say had a loop to it was on the Synsonic drums. You was able to put a pattern in there. You didn't have no other music. You just had that, the drums. So that was my first production on the Synsonic drums. I would probably say back in, uh, what is that, 87 Synsonic drums? Like 87, 88? Yeah, like, yeah. That was my first production that had a loop to it. <laughs> there was a song that I did with the Inseparable Sample that was on the Destiny Fulfilled album. I remember Beyonce asked me, what did I do that? I said, you want to know the truth, Beyonce? I used to always loop this in my head when I was little, and I just came to putting it in front of you guys right now, and you guys made it a smash, you know what I'm saying? So she was just like, wow. I was like, yeah, because I used to love this part. This was my favorite part of the song. As well as Love's in Need of Love Today, the ooh, I actually used that for one, which is Busta Rhymes with Erica Badu my favorite part of the song. Yeah, so early on production in your mind, you know, gets a chance to, you know, showcase itself, given the opportunity from artists like Busta Rhymes and Destiny's Child. Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis was an amazing uh, situation. That was, all, that was for the Janet album, which Janet had called me and asked me that I wanted to be a part of that amazing journey. And uh, it was weird going into, uh, Flight Time Studios, you know, that's a place that I never thought I would ever go. And to go in there and to see Jimmy and his element, Jimmy buys every album, every album, no matter what it is, he buys it to this day, he buys every album. And he has every beat machine in his studio. And Terry's kind of like the one where, you know, I, I, shared, I shared moments with both of them separately because Jimmy is the one that's kind of like, you know, the, the hands-on thing with the music and stuff like that. And then uh, Terry, I was able to uh, sit in on a mix with him when he was mixing the Osley Brothers record. But we did the All For You album, and uh, it worked out very well. And I just thought, like, once I'd worked with them, but you're like, come on, man. Once you send me home with Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, you got me on that cred. Ain't pretty much too much you can say to me after that. <laughs> Buster, the first time I had uh, a sonic encounter with him, being a fan of Leaders of the New School, of course. It was him and Spliff coming to my house in the Burgundy Land Cruiser, and he had just got his cassette from Dilla. And Dilla, on that, on that cassette, it had Stakes as High. Uh, it was a few other beats on there. But then I noticed that, you know, Buster had this thing where when he was in the car and he heard a dope beat, he would jump around and do this little thing. I don't know if anybody's seen um, Everything Remains Raw video, but that really exists in his truck. I think one was the beat that he liked 
and from there we just kept going. We just kept going from from uh, when disaster strikes to anarchy to Ely. Uh, we just kept going. We just kept going. Wonderful career with Buster that I have as far as with music. I've worked with Janet Jackson, Christina Aguilera, Redman, Eminem, 50 Cent, Mary J. Blige, Method Man. Oh man, Red Man, Red Man. My brother, you know, put me on back in the early 90s. I was actually an artist. I was his hype man. Uh, but I also was doing music. That NPC 60 was a big thing that I got my hands on through him and through Zan the Man. Because when I first started doing music, uh, my boy Shake and Mike Orgow took me over to Teddy Riley's. And Teddy Riley's took me to Zan the Man and then Zan the Man uh, let me come to Jersey and, and uh, he taught me how to use a lot of the equipment. But then I went, I, Red Man came along and hooked up with Red Man. We started producing, but I was also rapping, you know? I was on stage rapping with him as a hype man. And uh, I got sick of the, the whole lifestyle of the tour and everything. And I came home and started doing beats. But I, I, was, I was doing beats for a lot of people, even though I was on tour. I was doing beats for Organized Confusion, Flatliners, um, Shazzy, that was on Electra. So Red Man pretty much catapulted my whole thing. You know what I'm saying? Working with Chris, Christina Aguilera. Uh, Christina came in a group package. What studio was that? Westlake Studios in Santa Monica. I will always put myself into the mix, no matter what crazy studio I was able to get into. I always wanted to be in the studio everybody was at. Back then it was Enterprise, it was Conway, Westlake, Record One probably still are today, but that's where it was. And I was actually in the studio doing something. I had a production session and Missy was in the next room. So of course, me and Missy has history. So uh, I went in her room and she was just like, Rock, I need you to help me with a project. She said, you familiar with the song Lady Marmalade? And I was like, yeah. I said, uh, yeah. Not one of my favorite songs because I don't like, I used to hate minor chords when I was little, you know what I'm saying? I was like, yeah, but I, you know, I'll I do it. And she said, okay, I need you to work on the track for me. Now, here's the crazy thing. What my plan was is when I, when I asked her, I said, uh, well, will you put me in the studio for 24 hours with any keyboard I want? And she said, yeah, whatever you need to do, just go just to it. I ordered the 5080 with all the cards. I ordered the 2080 with all the cards. I ordered the Andromeda. I ordered like mad keyboards that I hadn't experienced with yet. Put those, it was keyboards everywhere. Was keyboards and modules everywhere. The Roland 2080, the Roland 5080, the XP50, the Andromeda. So here's the Triton next to me, right? So here's all these other keyboards. So I listened to the song, I listened to the song, I listened to the song. I was like, all right, I have two, two, parts, two parts. You know what I'm saying? I didn't use none of these keyboards for the song. I went right to the Triton. Da -da 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 -da. All right, let me hear that back. When it's playing it back, I was like, Going to the Andromeda and everything, right? Finished the song, they loved it, and that's when the girls came along. You know what I'm saying? We worked on the Lady Marmalade Project, me, Missy, Ron Fair, and um, it established a relationship between me and Christina Aguilera. You know what I'm saying? That's when I really found out about her, her, her skills and everything. Because of course she went last, and I was always like, why is she going last? I would think Pink would have went last because, you know, I knew Pink. I knew of Pink what she was doing. But then when uh, Christina came in, that little short girl, I realized why she was going last. You know what I'm saying? Not to put nothing, put nothing on Pink, because Pink is one of the most powerful singers ever. You know what I'm saying? But I understood why she went last. You know what I'm saying? You know, and it made sense. But it also established a relationship between us. And we started hanging out, chilling out and everything. And, uh, I remember when we hung out one night and uh, Let's Get Dirty came on by Red Man. And she came across the table with drinks and everything. She said, Rock, you make me one of these, we're f***ing out of here. So I said to myself, okay, I said, uh, Red Man had wrote on the Let's Get Dirty song about how he couldn't get in the club. Not one of the DJ's favorite songs to, to cut up because, you know, you're rapping about how you can't get in the club. It's not like y'all gonna make me lose my mind up in here and up in here or any other song like, you know, like a Timmy, you know, delay so what you're saying, you know. So I used to think the song was okay, but when Christina asked 
that she was her favorite song because you do it. I said, oh, okay. I said, I could do a version for her and change it into a pop version of the song. Let Red Man come on it and hope to God that he kicks, a, you know, the 16 that I need and then save the record. Because I thought that Let's Get Dirty didn't do as well as it should have done. So we gave, uh, I gave her the beat. I twisted the sounds. And she thought it sounded a little too much like the original. So she sat on it. Now back then, you got to think, back then the artist was able to chill for like a year or two with the albums until they worked on it. From what I heard, the story from Christina is, is that they had all of these records, the incredible records, Impossible, Beautiful, Can't Hold Us Down, Scott Storch had did a, 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 they had everything on there, Fighter, everything on there. But they still needed her breakout record. She played Dirty, they loved it. We ended up doing it. She took off all her damn clothes, scared the shit out of us, because we didn't know. We didn't know, because she went from Genie in a Bottle to nothing, you know what I'm saying? But she did that, Red Man came on the track, and did one of the most phenomenal 16s. Hot damn, rock a damn, like a summer show. I keep my car looking like. That's what we should have had on the Let's Get Dirty thing. But he pulled it through, one of the biggest pop songs. I, I think one of the biggest pop underground songs of all time. One thing that Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis taught me is that the groove is the first of, the first and foremost main thing that you gotta have. You gotta have the groove. I would do a track and let the main part of the groove loop the whole day. I gotta find a groove to it. I think as I'm getting older, I'm a little slower at that process, but younger, smoking weed and, you know, and everybody on the block had beat machines and we're all trying to not battle each other, but everybody's trying to impress each other. I think I was more quicker on the uh, delivery of that. And then after that, I'll just add sounds, you know? But I was tough on the groove. I was really tough on the groove. You know, so the Rock Wilder was a very tough groove. Do It Again was a very tough groove. You know, Desk Get Dirty was a tough groove. Dirty was a tough groove. A lot of stuff that I did for Buster were tough grooves, you know. So just aggressiveness, very aggressive, very to the point. Compared to most of these producers today, I was pretty basic, you know what I'm saying? They're a little more designed, you know what I'm saying? But I was basic. I was basic and to the point. And also was playing that shit. I wasn't sampling, I was playing that shit. The, the, the MP was, was, was like, I, whatever I couldn't do on the keyboard, I did on the MP. I found the sounds, I used 16 levels, and I made music out of the pads, you know? And all these little weird ass sounds I would get my hands on, because I wasn't one of those people that knew how to dig for records. I wasn't a digger. You know, I wish I was one of those plastic album cover diggers like people used to do, stay in the damn record convention for the whole day and find these amazing records. I wasn't one of those dudes. I was from church all the way, and what I did was is I learned a song from my um, from my brother's organ con uh, conductor. His name was Blaine Aiken, God rest his soul. He taught me this one song, and I learned that song using a Casio MT100 that my mother bought from Sears for like $100. Learned that song and uh, learned it in, in I would transpose. And also I wasn't playing the keys right. I wasn't playing the keys right. Like I remember one time I was playing my keys and this blind guy said, that's not the right way. And I was just like, well, you know, too late, dude. I'm like in my 20s, I'm smoking weed. I, I'm just, this is the way I'm gonna play it if you don't like it this way. He said, but what's funny is you're creating your own inversion. You know, he said, that's kind of weird for you to do that. But he said, because there's a theory way to play what you're playing. He said, but you're playing it funky. You're taking some of the back, back note or keys and mixing them with the, with the keys and you've created your own chord. And I was like, you know, I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Like, you know, my mother wasn't putting me in no piano class when I was little and stuff like that. So I was using that. But then once I was able to get some money, I bought me an MPC 60. And then from the 60, I bought the 3,000. Then from the 3,000, I bought the 3,000 and I bought the XP50, the Roland XP50. And that was a keyboard that was um, taking it to the next level. I remember that keyboard was the one that everybody was just like, $1,800, you get this damn keyboard, it's it. You know, got the cards in the back, 
You fill the cards up with sounds of the 60s and 70s, the orchestra card, the rave card, and that was pretty much like that. So when I had that, then you heard If I Get Locked Up Tonight by Eminem, you heard all like, you heard things that were being played on them things because now I have rich sounds. And then from there, um, I went to Reasons. And once Reasons came into my life, that was, that was crazy. Reason was an easy process because it's a rack of keyboards. Keyboards that are right there in front of your face. The Subtractor, the NN19, the, the, uh, the NNXT, the Combinator, which gave you some of the best sounds ever. And I started from 3.0. I went from 3.0 and now we're at 12 and I haven't stopped yet. I don't, I don't want to say nothing wrong, but I feel like the audio, auditory perception of how you hear sounds now, where you can actually put them behind you, in front of you, you know, all of that stuff. I wish I had that stuff. We didn't have that back then. You know, so I'm catching up. I'm trying to learn a lot of this stuff. I, I, don't, I don't know it, you know, but I'm willing to learn it. I'm, I, I got my machine too. I got my Fruity Loops. I got my propeller head. I got my Ableton. I got my Logic, which shocks me all every day when what Logic does. And um, I have, what else? I got Studio One. I got all of these joints in my computer. Just imagine if I had that when I was like 21 years old. My mother would have had a Harvard student. All she had to do was just take that computer and be like, all right, if you don't give me these type of grades, you ain't getting your computer. I would be like, what? Harvard. <laughs> one thing, I think one thing that sets me in a great place, and it's a blessing, is that I used to DJ. So when you produce, most of the time, these producers are not producing like DJs. They're producing on what they want people to hear from them, not producing for what you would want those people to like. That's how I would produce. So, and, and I also come from an era of the Q-tips, the Large Professors, the Pete Rocks, the Beat Miners, the Buck Wild, the DITC, you know what I'm saying, the crew. So our intentions were to you know what I'm saying? Just Blaze, Bank, um, uh, Knots, all of these people that produce were trying to get you to, you know what I'm saying? Get the crowd to dance, Swiss beats. He wants you to dance, you know what I'm saying? He wants you to energetic, he wants the energy. He wants to share that energy with you. You know, and then a lot of producers now, no disrespect, because there are some great producers, Metro Boomin, Mike Will made it, um, Sunny Digital, you know what I'm saying? A lot of great, dope producers right out, out right now. And um, their whole process is drag and drop, emulate what's going on. Back then it was like, we was trying to make you impressed for what, you know, if Buster doesn't make an ugly face, you, you have no track. You know, if Buster, if you have a session and Buster does not turn his back and look at you and go, you failed. You failed the mission, you know what I'm saying? Or if you don't press a track and, you know, and, and Eric doesn't, Eric Sermon doesn't get up and leave the room, you know? You know, or Pharrell doesn't bop his head and leave the room. You failed. But a lot of these producers are not producing tracks like that now. There are some amazing artists that's coming out. I, I, I ain't gonna front, I, but I, my age is starting to tell itself. And there's a lot of young artists that's emerging. And they're emerging with a certain style, and I ain't tripping on it. It sounds cool. It sounds good. It's the sonics of what it is now. I guess the way I felt when my mother was telling me, what the hell is this, and I was playing top billing. All I hear is my door shaking from, you know what I'm saying? Somebody talking about milk. You know what I'm saying? Right. So I wish some of what was what was before what music was, I wish it would come back. And I do say that there are genres that do appreciate that. Country music still has it. Rock music still has it. Pop music is dabbling in it because they, you know, some of the hip hop has went into the pop. But I do wish hip hop grabbed some of that thing back that made it what it was. We need heroes again, you know what I'm saying? You know, I think the last heroes ended in that last, uh, 
that 90s, early 2000s, and I wish the heroes would just start emerging again. Because I don't know about the heroes now, you know. That's it.